Okay, today's uh, sermon, I think you'll like the title of it, A Cotton Candy Easter Today. We're reading from Luke's Gospel, uh, the 24th chapter. Uh, my scripture is 36 through 48. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them and greeted them. But the whole group was terribly frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why do you doubt that it is really I? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it is I myself. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, for ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see the marks of the nails and showed them the wounds in his feet. Still, they stood there undecided, filled with joy and doubt. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, when I was with you before, don't you remember my telling you that everything written about me by Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must all come true? Then he opened their minds to understand at last these many scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that this message of salvation should be taken from Jerusalem to all the nations. There is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. You have seen these prophecies come true. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word to us this morning. It's all, it's all too much. I mean, for 45 years, I've had a problem with Easter. And I know because some of you have told me you have a problem too. My problem with Easter is that it's just too much. The expectation level is too high. All around. It's all around, and I buy into it every year. Every year. I mean, I know that some of you are here, and this is one of the few Sundays that you'll come all year. And you expect to get enough out of the sermon today to last you all year. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> That's heavy. And some of you have come a long way, you know, visiting family. I had a man one time told me that his sister was coming all the way from Texas just to hear me preach. I said, first of all, she needs a life. That's number one. That's heavy. That's heavy. And all week in the church, all the preparation, all the, the flowers and the services and the music, and they're all wonderful. They're wonderful. But there is no possible way the sermon can live up to all that expectation. There's no way. But every year, every year, I buy into it. And it's always a disappointment. The Easter sermon is always a disappointment, so I'll just set you at ease right now. Okay? So why don't we just relax? Let's just relax. It's going, it's going to be a disappointment, so just relax. There's no possible way it can live up to the level of expectation that's just kind of built into this thing. I kind of thought of the, of the story, I think I told you, of the student who came back from, from seminary and he preached his last sermon in his student charge because he was going to be ordained and then, then he was going to move to his new parish. And he said there was an elderly woman crying all during the service and he asked her after the service why. She says, oh, it's because you're leaving us. 
And with much effective modesty, he said, oh, you mustn't cry. I'm sure they're going to send somebody better to take my place. And she really started to cry and said, that's what you all say, but every year it gets worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, every year the Easter sermon gets worse and worse and worse, and here we are. Here we are. Well, that, that's my problem. But you have a problem too. Many of you do. And I think it has something to do with this expectation thing also. I mean, you've come this morning. You've made the effort. This is a special time. You get dressed up, you come, you try to find a place to park, you try to get there early enough to get your position in your pew, you know, you work and all these things, and you'd have to be dead on your feet not to get some kind of lift from the service today. But what so many have told me is, is that an hour afterwards, or two hours afterwards, it's all gone. It's all gone. Certainly by tonight or by tomorrow morning. It's just all gone. And it's like the experience I had as a kid. The first time I'd eaten cotton candy. I, I think you probably know the experience. I was at a uh, circus and I had the choice of picking anything I wanted to eat. And the cotton candy looked the biggest and the best, so I pick that. And you know, when you bite into cotton candy, there's nothing there. <laughs> nothing. You bite again and again, and all you get is grit on your teeth. That's about it. And for some of us, we have a cotton candy Easter every year. We bite into Easter and there's nothing there. So I have a problem, and you have a problem, and I'm just hoping this year we can just kind of relax and see what Christ will do. We don't worry about living up to some kind of expectation. Let's just, let's just see what happens this morning. And as I reflected on this, I realized the disciples had a problem too. The disciples were taken completely by surprise by the first Easter. I mean, they found the tomb was empty and they hadn't a clue to what it was all about. Words like fear and anxiety and confusion are all used in the gospel story. And then the risen Lord started to appear to them. On the first Easter Sunday, you might remember the two disciples of Jesus. They're walking home. The party's over. And their candidate had lost. He had been nailed to a cross. Stuck in a tomb. They had hoped he would have been the one that would redeem Israel, but they would now have to look for someone else. And they were really dejected. They were, they were really sad, totally defeated. And here they were on a seven-mile walk home, and some guy who doesn't seem to have a clue about much of anything takes the seven-mile walk with them. And this seemingly clueless guy is Jesus himself. And he's not dead. As a matter of fact, he's more alive than ever before. But they didn't recognize him. And maybe that's the first thing we ought to think about today, this Easter. Does Jesus ever surprise you? He's like that. You can be full of despair and then all of a sudden you feel his presence when you least expected it. You can look out the window and see a beautiful wildflower blowing gently in the wind and it's, 
And it's as if Jesus just gives you a hug and whispers hope into your ear. Or you can be, how many times have you been lonely and, and then someone calls or texts and brightens your day? And you know that God cares. Jesus shows up in the least expected times, often through a friend's touch or in a sign of nature or a feeling inside that everything, everything's going to be okay. Don't be surprised. God knows when you need him. I think we ought to think about, too, to allow Jesus to address your doubts The disciples were full of doubts, even as Jesus stood right in front of them. I think Jesus is is pretty cool here. In verse 36, he shows up behind the locked doors, and in John, he says, shalom. He says, peace, which is the traditional greeting. But now it's so much more richer with the meaning as the Prince of Peace returns from the dead. And their first reaction is to think he's a ghost. And we might think the same. But I love his compassion. He doesn't ridicule them. He asks them about their troubled hearts and their troubled minds. And he offers just the evidence that they need. He shows them the scars in his hands and his feet. Yet even that isn't enough. And in verse 41, it captures the, the, he captures the complex emotions running through them and while they still did not believe because of the joy and the amazement that they were having. In other words, it was just too good to be true. This can't be true. And they were still struggling with it. Their joy, their amazement keeps them from fully buying that this is Jesus in the flesh. And so he eats. He eats some boiled fish to prove to them that he's not a ghost. Jesus doesn't mind addressing your doubts. He will provide the evidence you need right when you need it. He is the same Lord who said to Peter in the boat, come on out, come on out and join me on the water. And then he enabled him to do so. He is the same Christ who said to Thomas, come on, put your your hands in my wounds. And he's the same Lord who whispers to us, come to me. You who are weak and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I think we all at times need to be like the man who wanted healing for his son, but he had his doubts and he says to Jesus, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. So allow Jesus to meet you in your doubts. And then also allow Jesus to open your mind to Scripture. You know, you understand Scripture when it changes you. It convicts you. It uplifts you. It assures you, it fills you, it moves you, it comforts you, it grabs you, it changes you. Whenever you read the scripture, just ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it and apply it. Then read expecting to hear from God, and you will, you will. And when you do, pray it back to him. Thank God for his word and ask for his help to keep it. And then take the witness stand, you know. Jesus concludes with an interesting observation. He reminds them that he has fulfilled the scriptures in rising from the dead. And then he talks about preaching for repentance, for change, for all nations, and all people groups. And then he concludes, 
You are witnesses of these things. That's in verse 48. Shortly thereafter, he will return to heaven and send his Holy Spirit to guide them. This verse was not only for the disciples, but it's for us as well. You are witnesses of these things. Now, what is a witness? Well, in court, witnesses don't have to be eloquent speakers. They don't have to be experts. All they need to do is to share what they saw, what they experienced. They just need to convey their firsthand experience. And that's what Jesus calls us to do, to share what you have experienced with others. Now, listen, people can argue with you about what you believe about God, but they cannot argue with you about your personal experience with God. Your experience is your experience. And the disciples experienced Jesus face to face, and we experience him indirectly for now. We know when Jesus gives us hope. We know when Jesus convicts us of sin. We know when Jesus gives us a purpose and meaning. We know when Jesus carries us through. We know when Jesus gives us victory. We know. We just know. And we witness. We share what we know with others. There was that elderly couple I always loved. They'd been married for over 60 years. They were in front of the fireplace. And he kind of reached over and patted her on the knee. And he says, I'm proud of you. Her hearing wasn't good. She said, what? He says, I'm proud of you. She says, speak up. I can't hear you. He said, I'm proud of you. She says, well, I'm tired of you too. We need to listen. And listen good because the Holy Spirit will show you when and where to be a witness. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Your part is just to be ready. Just be ready to be obedient and not to miss an opportunity. I saw an example of this when a doing a Bible study. I can remember we were reading in the book of Acts chapters 3 and 4, and Peter and John, they just healed a lame beggar. And when a crowd gathers, Peter grabs the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. He's a witness. Well, the religious elite didn't like what was going on, and they had them arrested. And the next day, they went to them they went to the high priest and said, how did you do this miraculous healing? He said, by what power or what name did you do this? And the next verse says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And he respectfully gives his witness. And he ends in Acts 4.12 with these words, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And then I love the next verse. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unscholared, unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They had witnessed. And they had grown in their faith. There's a wonderful story about a couple. They've been married for many, many, many years, and they lived in the same house all through their marriage. And there was this beautiful tree growing in the front yard, and, and, and someone commented on it, and they said, oh, that's our marriage tree. He said, when we were young and we moved into this house, 
We planted this tree, and we were having a lot of problems with our marriage already. I mean, we were struggling, a lot of problems. And we did crazy things, as young people do, and and we decided to use that tree as a sign. If the tree grew and flourished, we would stay together. But if it died, then that would be a sign to us that we would separate. He said, that sounds crazy. I know it. It it sounds crazy. But, you know, it seemed important to us at the time. But they said, the wonderful thing is, we kept bumping into each other at night, carrying water to the tree. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? Christ is so eager for the relationship with us to work that he keeps carrying water to our resurrection tree. He keeps nourishing it. He keeps offering it to us in new and wonderful ways. He wants it to work. He wants it to grow. And when you and I love others, we are declaring that we have seen Jesus. When you and I take the time to serve others, we are declaring that we have seen Jesus. When you and I humble ourselves as we care for the sick, visit those in prison, give food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, water to the thirsty, and lift up the poor and weak, we are living as witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus in our own lives. And we're carrying resurrection water and giving others an opportunity to lose the veil of death and see the resurrected Christ in us. What could be better? That is what real Christianity is all about. That's why we're here this morning. That is what Christ has come to accomplish. He has come to make us new, to allow us to share in his resurrection, and thus to become who we really are, children of God. May it be so. No cotton candy Easter this year. Amen?